So we've got our new function, our inverse trig functions. We've seen how we graph them and the other sorts of things we're going to need to know how to do in order to use the functions is calculus. So let's see how we differentiate them. So inverse sine x. Now obviously at this stage I have no idea how to differentiate inverse sine, but I do know how to differentiate sine. So if I rewrite this and make x the subject, and instead of finding dy dx, I'll find dx to y. So dx to y, differentiate sine, you get cos. Now obviously we don't want the answer dx to y, we want dy dx. So there's the derivative in terms of y. That's unusual, we normally see it in terms of x. So to turn it back to x, we just play with the trig identities. Cos, I could rewrite as the square root of cos squared. Then the cos squared I could write as 1 minus sine squared. And we said x was equal to sine, so now I can get the x in there. So differentiate inverse sine, we get 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, let's do the same thing with cos. So we'll make x a subject, we get cos y. Differentiate cos, we get <laughs> minus sine, that's the x to y. So turn it upside down, once again, using our trig identities. We basically came up with the same thing, it's just one's positive and one's negative um, on that one. So negative, similar I guess with sine and cos, one goes to negative, one goes to positive, that makes sense. So inverse sine goes to 1 on the square root of 1 minus x squared, inverse cos goes to minus 1 on the square root of 1 minus x squared. So let's have a look at tan. Make x a subject, tan y. Differentiate tan, we get sec squared. Turn it upside down, sec squared. So I don't have to do the square root bit this time, it's already squared. Uh, the true identity, sec squared is 1 plus tan squared. Uh, tan was the x, so now there's no square root sign involved in this one. 1 over 1 plus x squared. So to generalize those, uh, first of all, if it's a linear function. If it's a linear function, so x over a, you end up with, instead of being 1 minus x squared, you get a squared minus x squared. And for inverse cos, same again. Instead of getting 1 minus x squared, you get a minus x squared. And you'll never guess what happens with inverse tan. One on one. Close. And that's where you've got to be careful, because oh. it actually is a on top, not 1 on top. So you get a on a squared plus x squared. That can be confusing, and that's why I never do it that way. Because this way makes more sense to me. If I just think of it as the inverse sine of some function, and then it's simply derivative over the square root of 1 minus the function squared. Inverse cos minus the derivative over the square root of 1 minus the function squared, and inverse tan, the derivative over 1 plus the function squared. So in each case it's consistent. Derivative is on the top, derivative is on the top, derivative is on the top. Whereas with the linear function, you do get a variation there. I, it's, I just find it easier to do the, the function x ones, to remember it that way. Mind you, textbooks tend to go with the x or no, the linear function, for some reason. Maybe I should write my own, anyway. Okay, so inverse sine of 5x, bingo. If I remember the function way, it's nice and easy. Derivative of 5x is 5 over the square root of 1 minus the function squared, 25x squared. Oh, the inverse swimming question. Inverse, Cosy. Oh. Hmm. Minus the derivative over the square root of 1 minus the function squared. X on 3. Okay, I might concede here the x on a is useful because it is x on 3. And so in that case, I could just write down 1 on the square root of a squared minus x squared. Maybe that's where it becomes useful. But had I done it the way I normally do it, then I'd say, okay, derivative is 1 third on the square root of 1 minus the function squared, x squared on 9. Well, fraction on a fraction's a bit awkward. Multiply top and bottom by... 3, because remember, that 9 is inside the square root sign, so when I pull it out, I'm actually got a third out the front. So multiply top and bottom by 3, and I get 1 on the square root of 9 minus x squared. e to the power of inverse cos. Well, now it's an exponential function that I'm differentiating. So the rule for that was differentiate the power, bring the power to the front, e 
power doesn't change. So the power is inverse cos x, so the derivative of that is negative 1 on the square root of 1 minus x squared. E, the power doesn't change. Um, I just tidy that up so it's all one fraction. So there we get minus E to the inverse cos x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Chain rule. Anarchy. Okay. Notice it's not tan to the negative 3. Now when I say that negative 1 doesn't represent the power. That's why we have reciprocal ratios. So we're saying the inverse tan function to the power of 3. We would not write that as tan to the negative 3. Bring down the power. 3, lower the power. 2, diff the inside. 1 on 1 plus x squared. So tidy that one up. There's our answer. Product rule. Write down the first diff the second plus write down the second diff the first. The faster you say it, the more impressive it is. So x squared, inverse tan of x cubed, differentiate that. Derivative on top, 3x squared, over 1 plus the function squared, x to the 6. Plus, write down the second, inverse tan x cubed. Diff the first, well x squared is 2x. Tidying that up, there we go, with 3x to the 4 over 1 plus x to the 6, plus 2x, inverse tan x cubed. Now we're starting to get some good functions. Imagine if you had to find stationary points. Woohoo! That would be difficult. You'd probably have to use a, a Newton's approximation or something like that for that. That's probably a bit hard to make X a subject there, isn't it? But anyway. Ooh. We shall do one day.